Next, I'll set levels and pan to create a rough mix. But before that, let me explain the meters and the main channel in Studio One, because they're a bit different than other DAWs. When you play back the session, the meter to the left of the fader shows you the signal level in dBFS. When you see the meter up in the red, it means that the channel is clipping or peaking or going beyond zero dB. But note that you don't see a typical clip light like you do in other DAWs or a peak signal level readout either. One workaround for this is to add the level meter insert in true peak mode but just make sure that it comes after any other plugins you've loaded as inserts. This will give you a pre-fader peak level readout, and the channel meter will give you a post-fader readout. As you can see, the fader adjustments that I make only affect the channel meter, not the level meter as an insert, because it's pre-fader and it comes before the fader adjustments. Note that there is no pre-fader metering option in Studio One unless you are input monitoring or armed for recording, here it automatically switched to pre-fader for recording and then back to post-fader for listening and mixing. Studio One Professional has an internal 64-bit floating point mix engine, so you do have some wiggle room to work with before the signal audibly distorts. However, it's generally a good idea to set the channel peak levels to around negative 6 dB as a starting point to make sure that your combined output doesn't clip. You can see this on the far right. This is the main channel, or master fader as it's often called in other DAWs. This is the combined, summed signal of all of the channels, and when they're set too high, this can cause the main channel to clip as well. When this clips, you'll definitely hear some audible distortion. The two values in blue show the peak levels for the left and right channels. You want these to be 0 dB or lower in the negative, which means that the main channel is not clipping. If this clips, you'll see a red line under each one up to 6 dB. The clip light will also light up in red, showing you your clip levels. So throughout this course, I'll be mixing low to avoid clipping and also to leave some extra headroom for mastering. On the top of each channel, there's a pan control where you can set the pan left or right. My toms, I'm going to pan in the mix to approximate their position in the drum kit. The way this kit was set up was tom one was on the left, Tom 2 in the middle, Tom 3 on the right, and Tom 4 is actually a second floor tom on the far left. Now when I refer to the stereo position for these, I'm using what's called drummer perspective, as if you were sitting behind the kit. That's the way that the overheads were mic'd as well, with the left channel on the left side of the drummer and the right channel on the right side of the drummer. You can also mix and record audience perspective, which would just be inverted. This is like looking at the kit from the front as opposed to sitting behind the kit like the drummer. I personally like drummer perspective, so I use this for almost all of my mixes. I'll also pan my shakers hard left and hard right. And the doubled guitar parts as well. Piano 1 is a high part, and Piano 2 is a low part, so I'll pan Piano 1 slightly right and Piano 2 slightly left to simulate two microphones placed at different positions inside the piano. Piano 3 is just a reversed swell effect at the beginning, so I'll leave that alone. Next, I'll just let the song play and adjust the faders to create a rough mix. Again, making sure that most of the faders are peaking no more than negative 6 dB. However, I may let my kick and snare and vocals be just slightly above that. I really like my kick, snare, and other fundamental instruments like bass and vocals to be really present in the mix.
Alright, so I've got a basic rough mix with just levels and pan. In the next video, I'll explain the difference between bus channels and VCA channels, and then I'll move on to adding effects inserts.